Okay, so it's 7.30, I'll, I'll go ahead and start, okay? So good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here today for the cardiology grand rounds. Uh, today is the first of uh, serial lectures for the George Bedford Cardiology Symposium. And our first speaker for this academic year is Dr. Srihari uh, Nehru. Um, I want to give a brief introduction for the George Bedford Cardiology Symposium. Um, this was founded in 2015 by faculty and friends on the occasion of a retirement with Dr. Bedford from BCU. Uh, their generosity was inspired by the goal of founding an annual symposium or lecture for the Division of Cardiology. Dr. Vedrovic served as the uh, Chair of Cardiology at VCU for 18 years. He was the Director of the Cardiac Catheterization Lab for 38 years and an Associate Chairman of Medicine for Clinical Affairs for 23 years. In addition, he was the first holder of the Martha and Harold Kimmerling Kimmer Eminent Professorship. Uh, following his retirement from the clinical practice in 2015, Dr. Vitrovic continues as a professor emeritus, served on the MCV Foundation Board, the Foley Heart Center Advisory Board, and the MCV Physician Board. In addition, Dr. Vitrovic is involved with the ACC Committee and Editorial Leadership, uh, participates on the FDA New Cardiovascular Devices Panel, and serves as a medical consultant. Um, now, our, our eminent speaker today, Dr. Sir Hari uh, Naidu, uh, he's an academic intervention cardiologist. Uh, he's an expert in the management of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, including the minimally invasive alternative to surgery, which is alcohol septal ablation. Uh, he's a co-author on the 2011 ACCFHA National Guidelines on the Diagnosis and Management of Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy. He's editor of the International Textbook on the Disease, runs a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy treatment center following over 1,400 patients. He has performed over 250 alcohol septal ablations, believed to be the largest case series by a single operator in the United States. Uh, Dr. Naidu uh, is the director of the Cardiac Cath Lab and Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Center at the Westchester Medical Center in New York. He's a two-year past uh, member, two-year past member of the uh, American College of Cardiology Intervention Scientific Council, and has served on the program committee for AHA annual scientific sessions. He's the author of over 200 original scientific manuscripts, and he has authored clinical practice guidelines and consensus statements on, be on behalf of the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, and the Society of Cardiovascular and Geography and Interventions. And also, he was uh, the chair of the best practices in the cardiac catheterization laboratory document since 2012 that outlines operations for cardiac catheterization lab in the United States. Uh, Dr. Naido is a founder and past chair of the Emerging Leader Mentorship Program uh, for SKY uh, in partnership with ACC and the Cardiovascular Research Foundation, uh, a national leadership pipeline initiated in 2010 that identifies and trains 12 interventional cardiologists every two years. Uh, also, Dr. Naido is a two-year trustee of the Society for Cardiovascular and Geography and Interventions, the primary professional society for physicians specializing in intervention cardiology, and was in inducted into the International uh, Andreas uh, Grunzig Society in 2016. He's also an alum of the Brown University, eight-year program in liberal medical education. Uh, he's the past president of the Alfred uh, Medical Society for of Brown University Alumni Association Board of Directors and trustee emeritus of Brown University. In 2019, he was elected governor and president of the New York State Chapter of the American College of Cardiology and president of the New York Cardio uh, Cardiological Society. In 2021, he was named uh, to the top 100 notable leaders in New York healthcare and trains New York business for his work in the national cardiovascular response to the COVID-19. In 2022, he was elected secretary of SKY and will be president of the society in 2025 to 2026. Um, if you have any questions, please um, feel free to type it in the chat box and we'll discuss with Dr. Nero at the end of the lecture. And um, our CME code will be ready hopefully by the end of the lecture. So we'll uh, post it as soon as it becomes available for everyone. Uh, Dr. Nero, please. Okay, thank you very much. You didn't have to go through all those things. I see uh, I see Dr. Vetrovic here in the audience and I wanna say a few words. I tweeted last night for those of you who follow me that you know, no matter what stage of career you're at, you need good friends, you need good mentors, you need good sponsors. and I want to say you have a, a gem in Dr. Vetrovic there. Um, there's, there's no quite, it, it takes a lot of time and effort to mentor and sponsor people. Um, and I, I know that uh, I mentioned all the things that he's done with me um, and for me over the years. And he's always, most importantly, taken the time uh, to meet with people. And I know at my stage of career, how hard it is to find time. Shannon is on this and she knows it's very hard to organize a lot of things. And so I've always appreciated the time and effort he's taken in mentoring others, including myself. So thank you. And it's an honor to be here for this uh, Vetrovic lecture. So this is an, uh, an exciting time for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I've been involved for 
almost 20 years now, uh, when it was really just a small passion of a few of us uh, who are interested in the disease. Um, and it has really evolved. Uh, my career has gone through subproduction production therapy and then moving into really taking care of a large swath of these patients at uh, multiple different institutions in a large region here in New York. And as you know, over the past couple of years, there's been a, um, uh, a, a new breed of, med of therapies and these med medications that are called cardiac myosin inhibitors. And that obviously has changed the dynamic of how we treat these patients. So I'm here to discuss, does Mavicamptin, and there'll be other medications to follow this, does this challenge our current concept of how we treat these patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Specifically, does this challenge the concept of moving to subproduction therapy in patients symptomatic with this disease? So the, the, uh, the presentation will go through HCM definition, prevalence, disease burden a little bit, the current pharmacotherapy the subproduction therapy, cardiac myosin inhibitors, and then kind of putting it all together. How do we treat patients in 2022 and beyond? And where, where are we going? So for those in the audience, uh, from a basic standpoint, we define HCM as any LVH that's uh, significantly asymmetric, but at least over 1.5 centimeters in a general population or 1.3 centimeters in any location in a patient with a genotype po positive or a strong family history of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You can see here on the right, you see a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy heart with LVH in the lateral wall, basal septum um, primarily, and on the left, a normal heart where all the muscle thickness is less than one centimeter. Now, this is pretty basic. We had a call yesterday about this. That The, the truth is we want to see asymmetry. If you see a significant amount of asymmetry, which is what we see in the pediatric population, especially if there's scar burden in that area in Apache and interstitial fibrosis uh, manner, these are HCM patients. And I think a lot of them have been missed over the preceding decades because they were thought to be benign variants or LVH from hypertension or alternate diagnoses. But I think we've now realized that the prevalence is one in 500 up to one in 300 in genotype positive from a genotype standpoint. So there is a lot more HCM out there clinically than we had uh, previously uh, understood. Fundamentally is caused by a dysfunction in the sarcomere, which is commonly due to gen genetic mutations of which there may be over 500 in a, at least 17 main um, uh, genes. The defect here, as we drill down, is really at the sarcomere. On the left, you have a normal sarcomere where you have normal contractility, the normal amount of cross bridging, effective relaxation, and ordered sarcomeres. You can see here in the small print in the middle that most myosin is in, or at least half myosin, 40, 50% is in the, is what's called the off state or super relaxed state. <clears throat> that means that less of it's available to contract and is not in the active contractility state. On the right here, you have the HCM sarcomere, where more of the uh, uh, myosin is in the on or active um, um, state, and only 15 to 20% is in what's called the super relaxed or off state. This is why the muscle is hypercontractile with EFs of more than 75 to 80%, and oftentimes the heart looks like it's constantly contracted. This results in diastolic dysfunction because, of course, if less is in the off state, then most of it is not being relaxed. And this re results, as, as I'm mentioning, into impaired relaxation, diastolic dysfunction, Disordered sarcomeres, and ultimately by that hypercontractility and what we feel is uh, ischemia in in that in the areas of maximal hypertrophy, these patients get more fibrosis and interstitial fibrosis and stiffness, uh, further leading to diastolic dysfunction. So this is the fundamental problem: diastolic dysfunction and um, and ultimately uh, systolic dysfunction from obstruction. As I'll show you. As I mentioned, the prevalence is much higher than we thought. It might be as high as one in 200 individuals. If you, if you think about it, it's extremely uh, high frequency in the population. So there may be a, over 600,000 patients undiagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And this is why there's such a birth of all these programs around the country and a lot of investment in this space. You can divide the phenotypes into four different uh, types, as you see here. The, the, the the first two on the left are the, by far the most common. The sigmoidal septum on the left is the most common seen in older patients where you have basal septal hypertrophy. The septum takes on an S shape. So the LV cavity is not as affected. It's usually a relatively uh, preserved LV cavity size, but there can be significant obstruction in the basal septum due to contact and, and interaction with the anterior leaflet, which can itself be abnormal. Number two, you have this reverse curvature seen more in younger patients with massive, massive hypertrophy, oftentimes significant fibrosis in the, in the base to mid septum in sort of a fusiform uh, uh, manner like that. This does usually impinge on the LV cavity resulting in diastolic dysfunction, both from myocardial stiffness, as well as from a decrease in the LV cavity size itself. But also depending on where the, obstruct, where the thickness is basally, you can have significant interaction with not just the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, but bileaflet and papillary muscles and the caudal attachments as well. Next, you have the apical HCM, where the hypertrophy is more in the apex. These may not be 1.5. Sometimes you'll have 
a smaller amount of hypertrophy, but it's significantly obliterating in the apex with significant EKG abnormalities and MRI findings consistent with apical HCM. Felt to be about 10% of the population uh, across gender, race, and ethnicities. And finally, you may have a, a tougher one to diagnose, which is essentially a neutral curvature where you have thickness in multiple areas. And it's not so asymmetric, but it is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, a little tougher to diagnose by MRI and um, EKG echo, as well as uh, genetic finding. Echo is the mainstay for diagnosis, as you all know, uh, due to provocable maneuvers and ability to look at the, all areas of the heart. We do our echo protocols with Definity, which allows us to pick up apical aneurysms, look at the lateral wall much easier, look at the apex in particular, uh, and really get much more um, you know, uh, intra-observer uh, reduction in variability, as well as from time to time, looking at these patients over time, comparing the same images and the same maximal wall thicknesses over time. Cardiac MRI has emerged as a much more important uh, uh, modality, both to look at how thick the heart is in different areas, um, to look at areas that are not easily visualized by echo, such as the apex of the lateral wall, and as well as to look inside the muscle to see what the fibrosis looks like. Does this fibrosis look patchy and interstitial in the areas of maximal thickness, which is typical of HCM, um, or does it look like it's a myocarditis or some other etiology uh, of hypertrophic uh, um, uh, phenotype? In addition, it's emerged that the amount of scar in these patients can have significant prognosis. So obviously, we want to see patients with 0% scar burden or late LED enhancement. But as you go up, we now know that between 10 and 15% scar burden, there seems to be, at least in observational data, an increased risk of sudden cardiac arrest in those patients. And over 30% scar burden, uh, as you might imagine, increases the risk of end-stage heart failure due to uh, a significant amount of muscle replaced by fibrosis in those patients. An important pathologic uh, uh, distinguishing factor is whether there's obstruction or not. And this is because of the fact of a few things. One is that patients with obstruction end up having a worse prognosis. They have more symptoms and, and decreased survival. Number two, uh, these are the ones that are targets for the, the main therapies we have, including the cardiac myosin inhibitors and the self reduction therapies. So both of these etiologies allows us to uh, take these patients and oftentimes make them less symptomatic. On the flip side, the non-obstructive patients tend to have significant diastolic dysfunction as their main problem. Some of them are more mild because if they have mild degrees of diastolic dysfunction, it may be compatible with a relatively benign course. But in some patients, they have the full-blown restrictive type physiology where they have a significant decrease in output, congestive heart failure, and ultimately need um, heart transplantation in, in, in a, in a uh, minority of patients, but a significant minority. The definition of obstruction, just to reiterate here, is that if you have anywhere greater than 30 millimeters of mercury under basal conditions, that's considered resting obstructive HCM, seen in 37% of patients. If you have latent obstruction, that means that you have no gradient at rest, but then on provocation, you get over 30. And then finally, the non-obstructive form is patients who have less than 30 millimeters of mercury gradient at any time point, even under maximal uh, provocable maneuvers. And the 30 is, uh, is picked mainly because that even a normal patient with, uh, if they have dehydration or they're tachycardic or they have hypertranquility from inotropes or, or, or um, um, endogenous uh, adrenaline, these patients may have gradients that are evoked, but typically will not reach over 30 millimeters of mercury. So really that criteria is based on the fact that once you get over that, it's, it's something more pathologic rather than a physiologic response to exertion and contractility. The natural history is important to understand. Many of these patients we feel have preclinical disease, meaning they have the genotype. Eventually, they get some degree of uh, some degree of diastolic dysfunction, which is oftentimes un undiagnosed, and, and often to the patient, they don't even know they have it. That's because in the beginning, all that does is decrease the maximal amount of uh, exercise and functional status that they have, which they oftentimes don't even approach. So they mostly don't notice a lot of that subtle diastolic dysfunction compared to an age and gender matched control. Ultimately, this uh, this increased actin myosin cross bridging, which results, which causes this, results in hypercontractility, thickening of the cardiac tissue, abnormal relaxation of the heart in progressive fashion, uh, and finally, reduced stroke volume, output obstruction, uh, mitral regurgitation, atrial fibrillation. Another way to look at this is this sequence here, which is that you have the genetic disorder of HCM that results in progressive diastolic dysfunction, reduced stroke volume, and output usually in the teenage to 20-year-old age. And then over time, if they develop obstruction, they tend to have much more symptoms than if they don't have obstruction. But the obstruction itself causes a lot of problems. Number one, it causes more feedback to have more hypertrophy. So you get hypertrophy begets obstruction, which begets more hypertrophy. 
And so you have a secondary hypertrophic uh, uh, syndrome uh, or provocation in these patients for growth after the obstruction develops. And once the obstruction, of course, that causes a regurgion in volume that results in atrial fibrillation as well, pulmonary hypertension over time from secondary uh, backflow of blood to the lungs, low cardiac output, which is oftentimes inter intermittent, meaning that instead of a car that is sort of, you know that it can go from one to two to third gear or fourth gear, maybe it stops there. And as time goes by, maybe they can't go to fourth, they can go to third. Now you have a car that that kind of stutters. It may go to three some days, it may go to five some days, it may go to two some days, or even from minute to minute based on changes in afterload when you take your medications uh, and preload. And so these patients oftentimes are more symptomatic than the regular heart failure patients, which are more predictable. These patients find their disease very unpredictable. They have good days, they have bad days, um, and they really can't place a finger on why sometimes they're much worse than others. And that's, just, that's a very pathognomonic path, uh, sign of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And of course, when you have obstruction, you also have a higher risk of sudden cardiac death, probably because of the fact that these are the patients with more hyper, uh, hypertrophy, as well as these are the patients that if they have syncope, they may have trouble restarting the heart. Um, and uh, so their heart is also not in a physiologic functional state to survive a sudden cardiac arrest or a prolonged DT. If you look at the total totality of the numbers, up to half of patients may have heart failure over the course of their life that is uh, clinically significant. 33% may will have a fib over, over time, up to 30% will have not sustained DT, and up to nine to 10% will have stroke from atrial fibrillation. And so it's very important to look for all these things in our patients. Are they having arrhythmias? Are they having um, arrhythmias that can cause stroke or sudden cardiac arrest? And what degree of heart failure are they living with? Is it benign right now or are they progressing? What are we trying to do for these patients? So short-term, obviously they come to us and we're trying to make them feel better. We wanna get them from NYHJ class three or four to one or two. We want to re resolve any lightheadedness or syncope in these patients. And, and ultimately, that improves their quality of life and allows them to go on living um, functional lives without their symptoms getting in the way. Ideally, and this is where medications and subrussian therapy seems to be coming into play, which is, can we affect the natural history of these diseases? It does seem, and I'll show you some of the data in a few moments, that subproduction therapy seems to improve the totality of the heart function that these patients tend to, seem, tend to have a normalization of the survival curves. Um, the question is going to come up whether these new medications can do the same thing. We know ICD can improve survival. It does look like SRT is improving the natural history of these of disease in patients who qualify for SRT, and we know that anticoagulation prevents stroke. But do new medications mimic some of these? Can it reduce sudden cardiac arrest? Can it improve heart failure? Can it improve survival? What does it do to AFib? And these are the questions that as we are interjected with these new medications, we're going to have to um, uh, cope with. So when I see patients, these are all the things, and I know you have a program down there as well. These are the things we work on. Uh, there's, a, there's a large amount of data on lifestyle modification, exercise modifications, diet, compliance with medications that really have a big uh, say in how these patients do over time. So a really cooperative patient uh, who is educated on their disease and really takes uh, the reins on, on handling their disease between visits are very important. There is traditional pharmacotherapy I will talk about today. Uh, there is some role for dual chamber pacing in some patients. ICD placement in a significant, maybe 20% of patients ultimately. Subproduction therapy we'll talk about more, novel pharmacotherapy. And finally, there's a role for heart transplantation in some patients as well. So the best programs in the country, as I'll show you later on, really are able to tackle all of these and give patients what they require on an individualized basis. basis. So medications, both the ACC and the ESC guidelines um, mentioned beta blockers as the first line, verapamil as second line, not deltize them typically mainly due to the, the data that's out there on these medications, and disoparamide. In general, beta blockers are best for alpha tract obstruction. Uh, verapamil is best for those who can't tolerate beta blockers or primarily for patients with uh, non-obstructive card uh, cardiomyopathy. There is some data that verapamil may be better than beta blockers in those situations, maybe because of a less of an effect on chronotropy, which these patients oftentimes uh, rely on for increasing output. And finally, one of the other distinguishing features is that disoparamide seems to be better at controlling both uh, resting and provocable obstruction, as opposed to beta blockers and verapamil really working more on latent or provocable obstruction. And finally, disoparamide also is good as an antiarrhythmic at controlling AFib. So there's a good synergy there in patients with obstruction with AFib to using disoparamide on top of beta blockers. I'm going to move past that one. So the main data we have on disoparamide is really observational, but I use it probably in 20 to 30% of patients, who are certainly older patients, those with AFib, 
um, to try to improve obstruction physiology and re decrease the incidence uh, and of AFib in these patients, which can cause decompensation. This is data showing about 120 patients, but really what it's showing here is that the gradient seems to go down. This is one of the few studies that have shown a, a decrease in resting gradient in the majority of patients uh, from 75 to 40. And there is an increase in the QTC that we need to watch, but it didn't seem to have on the bottom right here um, any increase in sudden cardiac arrest. So we do watch these patients. I will tell you over 20 years, I've only had one patient who had VT on disapiramide, but of course, that's probably about the same as what the rate would be in the background population of symptomatic HCM. So we really haven't seen an increase in the risk of uh, uh, torsades in these patients in general. Obviously, patients with an ICD in uh, already are safer, but we tend to do these um, initiations even as an outpatient in, in a small dose fashion um, with uh, EKG monitoring within 48 hours. So there are problems with, with the current medications before the novel ones have come out. So uh, these are all require compliance and BID dosing. Um, there's oftentimes a lot of side effects with medications, as you can see here. They do not modify the underlying substrate, and they only work while taking the medication. So for example, you know, you've got a patient who uh, is doing well, class two now with, with significant medication, maybe they're on beta blockers, calcium blockers, and disapiramide, or beta blockers and disapiramide. Uh, the problem that happens as they get older, and now I've been following patients for 10, 20 years, is that they will have other issues in their life. They will have emergent surgery. They will have other times where they have to stop their medications. And it becomes quite challenging if they end up at other hospitals where they have obstructive physiology and they can't take their medications. Uh, and now they have to have other surgeries or they have GI bleed, um, other issues where they can't take their medications. And there's really no good IV formulation of disoparamide. What do you do for these patients? They go from being stable to unstable without good medical therapy that can um, carry them through those episodes. So that is a big problem with medications that we've had. Um, and oftentimes I have the conversation with my older patients when the dominoes start falling and they, um, it looks like they're going to need surgery or they're going to have, they have cancer or other things that need to be addressed. Sometimes in these patients, it's better to get the obstruction out of the way. So one of the things that we have to talk about is when do we move to subreduction therapy? So across the country, there are, there are probably about 40 programs of, of excellence for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And there's quite the variability in when, in when you move to subreduction therapy in these patients. Some places continue these medications for a long time, and patients do well, but they have side effects in the medication. They're probably not as compliant as they could be. Um, or do you start ditching the medications, decreasing the medications, and move on to the subreduction therapy? And as I mentioned, oh, some of the big places like ours, you know, no, no, no. people can mute their line. Um, some of the big places like ours that do high level myectomy and alcohol ablation, we will oftentimes move uh, to alcohol ablation and myectomy earlier to try to minimize medications, minimize side effects, but more importantly, to make them more autonomous, meaning to make their heart function better on its own so that they're less dependent on medications as they get older. And that's a concept that we've only struggled with uh, because of the fact that we do so many of these and we have excellent outcomes. Uh, have we moved the needle more towards SRT? <coughs> so, um, uh, okay. so alcohol ablation uh, is where I got involved. I, I trained at University of Pennsylvania, graduated in 2004, and we had done just a few of them there. You know, the procedure was only invented in the late nine, mid to late 90s uh, in Europe and came here somewhere around 98 to 2000. So I started my fellowship in 2000, and so we, we did some of the early experience in this. Obviously, the technique is to get a balloon um, into the septal perforator. It was always the first septal in the, in the beginning, but we've since learned that there's lots of different septal perforators you can use for these, but it's most important to find the one that's going closest to the area of SAM contact with the septum. You find that area, you inflate the balloon, and you inject a small amount of alcohol, and that number has gone down over years to have a limited infarction of just the basal septum at that region to cause a uh, to cause a regression of, of LVH in that, in that area, a widening of the alpha tract, and a, a less ability to interact with the anterior leaflet, and ultimately no alpha tract obstruction. I've been doing this again for a long time. This is kind of my 20th anniversary of, of doing my, my first alcohol ablation. Um, since that time, you've already gone through what I've done uh, in HCM, and it's very exciting because it always started for me, I'm an interventional cardiologist, but this always started as something on the side, and now it's kind of come front and center over time. Um, I published this in 2018 because after the guidelines, there was a lot of discomfort with what do you do with alcohol ablation or which places are good at it. 
we put the, in the guidelines that you should do at least 10 a year um, to be proficient at both myectomy and alcohol ablation, yet nobody knew where those centers were. So we published this to, to get an uh, overview of what places were doing it so that at least you can send patients to places that have had a significant uh, experience. Um, I do need to update this, but at the time, this is what was happening. Uh, we were doing the most, about the over 40 a year at that time. We're doing slightly more now. Uh, Medical University of South Carolina, because that's where Bill Spencer had gone after Baylor. Uh, and then Scripps and the others, as you see here, there's probably twice as many programs now since then that are doing high, high quality, uh, high volume alcohol ablation. Here's the hemodynamics from one of the earlier patients I had. There's a couple of things you can point out here. Number one is you see that the LV and the AO have a gradient, which you can see in anything that has obstruction, including aortic stenosis or, or, or membranes. But the key point here is that the gradient is dynamic. And also that after a PVC, you have this, uh, this characteristic uh, physiology where you do see the grading go up, but you may see that with anything with a PVC because the next beat is hypercontractile. So even in AS, the gradient will go up because you'll push more blood out. But in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you actually push less blood out. So where you see that is a decrease in the pulse pressure between here and here in the next beat. This, this distance, this pulse pressure here is less than this pulse pressure here. And that means that less blood goes out. So you have a hypercontractile state that, in, that increases the gradient, but less blood gets out. And that's characteristic of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And distinct from a membrane or aortic stenosis, where you have a thick obstruction, and with hypercontractility, you will be able to push more out so the stroke volume goes out, but the gradient goes up. After <laughs> ablation, you see an improvement in the gradient. That may wax and wane for the first uh, for the first week, but then over time, as this continued regression of the LVH, you have an improvement in obstruction. This is an example of an echo about 10 years out from alcohol ablation, showing a nice thin septum that's now one centimeter. The, the mid septum is a little thicker. The mitral valve is now normal and a large alpha tract uh, indicating no gradient. This is actually a patient who was 38 when I did her first alcohol ablation. She had only one alcohol ablation. Uh, subsequent to that, she's had two pregnancies uh, and has done well and continues to follow with us. So there was a lot of debate. Um, those of, of us who've been around for over 10 years in the field know that there was a lot of debate about alcohol ablation or septal myectomy. At the conferences, we used to get up on stage and you know, hack each other down on which one's better. The truth is they're both great procedures, as I'll describe. Um, they both have the same indications. You have to have symptomatic patients, either with lightheadedness, syncope, presyncope, or heart failure symptoms. They have to have adequate anatomy, at least a septal thickness of 1.5 to 1.6 in, in the area where you're going to ablate. They have to have sufficient gradient to justify that the gradient is a significant um, a linchpin part of the physiology. And they have to have the obstruction of physiology with systolic anterior motion of the, of the mitral valve or some apparatus that's contact from the septum. If you have that, then patients do qualify for ablation or myectomy. Ablation has been performed for over 25, almost 30 years now. It's minimally invasive, avoids anesthesia. Patients are awake. I usually just give a little bit of morphine during the uh, injection of alcohol, otherwise they get no sedation um, so that I can watch their gradients during the case. Obviously, it's reduced cost and length of stay. Myectomy, which we do here as well, we do about 30 myectomies and about 50 alcohol ablations a year here, and the myectomies have done quite well as well. I, I, truth be told, there are a different population of patients that need to be done. Uh, places that don't do an, enough of them tend to have a, a problem with uh, knowing where to cut and being worried about cutting too deep and causing a VSD. But the real issue is you do a first cut and then you do a second cut, and this allows you to get much deeper into the septum all the way to the base of the papillary muscle that allows you to have a nice wide output tract all along any area that potentially might contact. So this has been going on for over 50 years. Uh, it's done quite well um, and it has excellent results and you can decrease medications. But of course, it's an open heart procedure with some complications that is worse in older patients, of course. But if it's done well, the key point here is that relief of obstruction re reduces this cycle. It breaks this vicious cycle. And what you end up seeing is that because you have a break in the cycle, you no longer have this feedback loop and that allows you to have a lot of regression. So there's regression of LVH, an improvement in symptoms, and an improvement in obstruction, of course. And we've seen now in both myectomy and alcohol ablation that up to two years out from these procedures, you have a defervescence of the diastolic dysfunction. You have decrease in septal mass, but you also have a decrease in remote mass that's very similar to the decrease in the septal mass, which means that it's causing a complete remodeling of the heart. And how we see this clinically is that the patients do feel better in three to six months, but they continue to feel better over time. 
And so at one year, at two years, we can, we can get rid of more medications. And oftentimes we can get rid of the diuretics that these patients are on, but that takes a while. It took you a while to get to this stage. So it oftentimes still takes a couple of years, even after the obstruction is relieved to get back to normal. Think about like an MS patient or an AS patient who have pulmonary hypertension uh, or other physiology from the backflow of blood. These patients will take time for a lot of that to reverse over time. And so you have to see the same thing in HCM. The effects of alcohol ablation, I'm actually, this is important for our subsequent discussion on CMIs. Uh, there is an improvement in peak VO2, somewhere around three to four with alcohol ablation and about six with myectomy. There was only one study in myectomy. But keep in mind, there's a difference in age. And as age goes up, your peak VO2 goes down. And so the three to four increase in alcohol ablation uh, patients is about the same percent improvement in VO2 for that age as a six is for uh, myectomy patients. And this just gives you an idea of what the peak VO2 is based on different ages. Uh, and explains why um, the overall percent improvement in peak VO2 is commensurate uh, between, between the two procedures. Large data from, uh, from uh, Sharif Nagay at um, Houston Methodist uh, from alcohol ablation. This was published now 10 years ago. There hasn't been a subsequent collaboration like this, but I think uh, now with the HCM Society formula, we probably will have that. This is from Bill Spencer's uh, data, as well as about um, eight to 10 other institutions. They had 900 patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy undergoing alcohol ablation. You can see all, over 90% of patients are getting to class uh, one or two. So this is a, a significant improvement in their symptoms from class three. Procedure mortality is overall less than 1%. Per, less than 1%. Pacemaker rate went from 28% in the early days to 6.5% over time. Um, and there's been a lot of improvements in technique. And I, I can talk about that offline. Um, if you, I know you guys are, uh, want to do alcohol ablation there as part of your program. We've, re we've reduced the amount of alcohol, the amount of targeted septals. We've done myocardial contrast echo guidance, and we have active fixation PVP. So all these things together have decreased the rates of complications and uh, improved the uh, pacemaker rates of these patients as well. There's a lot of debate about alcohol ablation versus septomyectomy. The time there, um, but overall, at, at multiple different institutions, Cleveland Clinic, Duke, as well as uh, Mayo Clinic. There was really no difference in overall mortality, as you can see here. In fact, what they found is that myectomy and ablation were, were superimposed. And this is the Mayo Clinic data, where about 80% of patients to 90% of patients were getting myectomy, and really just the high-risk patients and older patients were getting ablation. And so this is where some of the discussion came up about alcohol ablation not being as well as uh, myectomy, because a lot of the big institutions were holding ablation for patients who are high-risk, similar to SABR versus TAVR. You have to compare apples to apples. So when they did an age and gender match control, they found that even in their highly selected population, the overall survival with ablation and matching were, were exactly the same, uh, indicating that these, these procedures are interchangeable in patients who can meet indications for either. But also more importantly, if they meet indications for ablation or myectomy, um, you select them for those procedures, these patients do quite well. So it's really more about the selection. This is just more data showing how we do after ablation myectomy, the overall mortality and sudden cardiac arrest mortality is low, 1.5% overall mortality per year in both arms, and the sudden cardiac arrest mortality is 0.4 and 0.5. This is important because as I mentioned before, the obstructive patients, certainly those with class three symptoms, which are the ones getting alcohol ablation and myectomy, have a higher mortality usually than the non-obstructive patients or patients who don't need subproduction therapy. Yet after SRT, their mortality overall and their incidence of sudden cardiac arrest is quite, quite low and matches the general population of HCM. And this is why we're normalizing, it seems to be that we're normalizing the rates of mortality and improving survival in patients after they get sudden reduction therapy. It's funny because we, we see a lot of patients here, and I'm sure you guys do too, and the quietest patients, the ones that are doing the best, are the ones that are not symptomatic very much, or the ones who went through a very symptomatic phase and then have these SRTs, and now they go to a quiet phase again. So they, they all of a sudden don't show up for their visits as much. They're doing well. And when they come in, they're really well checked. And so this is part of the reason why the hardest ones to control are the ones that are on medications in that gray zone, whether they meet indications for SRT or not. And these are really the ones where we have to decide going forward, do we move to SRT or do we simplify their medications with a medication such as Mavicamda? Um, we do a pretty extensive heart team here. So every Tuesday we have a HCM heart team meeting and we have about 15 people uh, in the room and we present the cases that we're considering alcohol ablation and myectomy. The take home message here really is that there's a lot of factors that go into how we decide which patient gets myectomy and which patients get alcohol ablation. 
Um, and really, I would say 90% of the time, it's very, very obvious what the patient should have. And we don't present them with both options. We just tell them, just like we do for cabbage or PCI, what is best for them based on the literature that, and the expertise that we have. So there's very few patients that are on the fence or that could go for both procedures. Um, because if you look at it from a, what is going to get you 90 to 95% efficacy, it's usually very obvious which one would get you there with the least risk <coughs> and which one can't get you there. Uh, so alcohol ablation in general is best for patients who have particularly favorable anatomy. These are mostly the sigmoid septal patients, the older patients with sigmoid uh, septum. Um, patients who failed myectomy and need a redo, maybe consider alcohol ablation if there's a small area of contact that's remaining. Patients with pre-existing right bundle branch block or with an IC, ICD already or pacemaker already in place. Um, and then there's a developing field of patients prior to TAV or TMVR in a select group of patients where you might be able to decrease their risk of uh, subsequent alpha tract obstruction. Surgical myectomy reserved for patients who are uh, kids. We have a pediatric surgeon who does our pediatric myectomies here as part of our team. Massive LVH, over, th over three massive gradients, over 100 resting. Um, anybody with concomitant surgical, valvular, or coronary disease, membranes in the alpha tract. This is an important one because it's oftentimes missed. So if there's a suspicion for it, we do TEs on this pa th these patients to look for membranes and the actual etiology of obstruction in these patients. Uh, anomalous papillary muscles, absence of acceptable septal perforators, and pre-existing left bundle branch block. The 2020 guidelines came out, and just to take you through the treatment for that, uh, you're supposed to treat comorbidities and then determine if they're obstructive. If they are obstructive, you start with beta blockers, move on to verapamil, and then you can decide disapiramide or structural reduction therapy. But importantly, all of these are class one. So all of a sudden, although it's mostly consensus opinion, everything became things you should do for these patients. And then when you go to septal reduction therapy, you have options. Everything again is class one because there's now a wealth of data, uh, at least observational for these, for these procedures to perhaps change the natural history. If they're not a surgical candidate, then they go to alcohol ablation. If they are a surgical candidate, it really depends on whether they have other indications for surgery. If they do, they get myectomy. If they don't, you have an option. And how you decide about the option was really left out of the guidelines this time. Uh, but hopefully we'll be on the next guidelines that should be coming out in 2024. And so it doesn't pay enough attention to all the other things that we just talked about in that flow diagram that I mentioned, all the different factors that sway you towards one or the other. So before the CMIs came on the, on the, on the uh, landscape, really the, the practice was medical management until symptoms abate or side effects develop. We then added disopyramide in older patients and those who can tolerate the side effects, especially those with PAF. And then at experience centers, we moved to earlier SRT. Um, now, what is an experience center? We published this in 2016. This is together with Cornell, we looked at the NIS database of alcohol ablation and myectomy. And we found that most places were not quite experienced. So this is a, a little bit of a difficult graph to read, but what you're seeing here is the number of procedures and the number of hospitals. So the vast majority of hospitals were, having, were doing less than 10 procedures. They were doing five or 10 procedures over eight to 10 years. So they're doing about one procedure or a half a procedure per year. So that's what was going on in the landscape. So I took this upon myself uh, and others took it upon ourselves to decide that we need to go out and train more places to do alcohol ablation and myectomy. Because if you see this landscape, you see that in the real world, pacemaker rates were quite high. Mortality was very high with surgery, especially in very low volume places where it was approaching 15 to 16%. Um, and even in alcohol ablation, there was a there was a curve favoring places that do more than 10 a year, which were very rare. Uh, but as you can see here, the real world outcomes were not nearly as good as we were getting at Mayo or at our institution. And so there's a lot of work to be done. So there's two things, so two ways to think about this. Can we get this work done out there and have places do this well? Or is there something more um, egalitarian or something more available such as medications that may level the playing field and not make these therapies as useful? Are needed. And that's where, we're, that's where we have to really spend our time and attention right now. I published this also last year. This is looking at pacemaker rates and death rates by gender, uh, stratified by myectomy or alcohol ablation. And the only thing we found here really is that the pacemaker rate was much more stratified by gender than anything else. So pacemaker rates in alcohol ablation were much higher than in men. And interestingly, the pacemaker rate in men was very low and even lower than surgery. <coughs> so if you look at it, if you have a patient who can get alcohol ablation and is a man, uh, if you think they're going to have a high efficacy, their safety profile is actually quite good. They'll have a very low incidence of pacemaker, for what reason we don't know, uh, with the same efficacy. 
So this is uh, this data, I think, helped us determine uh, from a gender standpoint which procedure might be better. This is from the guidelines showing the different types of centers of HCM and, and comprehensive centers really can do everything. Primary centers do some of these things and referring centers send on. But the main distinguishing factors is whether you do alcohol ablation and mastectomy, whether you do pediatrics, whether you do heart transplantation. So let's move on to the new medications. <clears throat> There's two new medications that we've been investigating. One is Mavicamptin that was just recently approved. And the next is Apicamptin that we're involved in the randomized trial right now. Um, myocardia became Bristol Myers uh, um, Squibb. So that, that is the owner of Mavicamptin right now. And as I mentioned, there are some unanswered questions about how to handle these medications in the context of SRT. We published this a while back. This is just sort of where we're looking at Mavicamptin and all the different medications that have really kind of come and gone. There is still some data for some of these, such as um, Renexa, uh, but Mavicamptin now is at the bottom here, which is, uh, which is the first one that really has had a significant benefit. Um, I'm going to move fast past this. Okay. So Mavicamptin and Apicamptin, as I mentioned earlier, we talked about this percent of sarcomeres that are in the off state or the super relaxed state. That's what SRX means. So about 15 to 20 percent when the super relaxed state um, in uh, HCM and a healthy heart should have 40 percent. So this is some of the preclinical data showing that Mavicamptin improved the percent in the relaxed state, which means you're improving diastolic function and decreasing the hypercontractility, hypercontractility in these patients. They also showed in mouse models that there was a decrease in fibrosis in these patients as well. And as you can imagine, by doing this, you have a shift of the uh, pressure volume loop to less contractile uh, without too much uh, decrease uh, uh, change in heart rate and, and really no difference in cardiac output. There are some important differences between Mavicamptin and Apicamptin, um, and this leads to some of the FDA warnings on Mavicamptin because of the long half-life and some of the drug-drug interactions compared to Apicamptin. The main study that looked at Mavicamptin and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was the Explorer trial. The caveat to this trial was it was mostly a class two heart failure population, but randomized Mavicamptin versus placebo. And what they found was uh, in the class two population, there was a 37% improvement in the Mavicamptin group and a 17% improvement in the placebo group, and that was statistically significant. And the improvement in the primary endpoint was a decrease, was an improvement of peak VO2 by 1.5, um, with at least one NYHA class improvement or an improvement by at least three. Now keep in mind, as I as you recall, that the difference with alcohol ablation and the macrine was somewhere about four to six peak VO2 increase. So they were looking at a little bit more modest improvement based on medication. But here's some of the important data I think that is also very relevant, which is that the gradients went down both resting and, and provocable. EF didn't really change, as you can see here. And importantly, we're seeing a theme here that BNP starts going down and stays down. So these patients are in less heart failure or less strain on the heart. And, in, and there's also a decrease in troponemia. So symptomatic patients with HCM oftentimes have troponin elevations, as you'll see, and this goes down as well. So the heart seems to be much happier after these medications are in play. And this is just another way of looking at the classes going down um, with Mavicamptin versus placebo. And they also looked at it as a complete response. If you look at complete response as patients who have uh, NYHA class one, which are asymptomatic and no gradient over 30, so non-obstructive, 27% of patients became non-obstructive and completely asymptomatic with Mavicamptin versus really nobody in the placebo group. Um, I published this and presented this at ESC. This is the uh, symptom score for, from Explorer. We looked at a new HCM symptom questionnaire that is uh, different than the KCCQ and involves shortness of breath, tiredness or fatigue, cardiovascular symptoms such as chest pain and syncope. Then we took the shortness of breath questionnaire, which are really four questions. Two of them were grandfathered out. Four of the questions we looked at and we found a new symptom score, which we published that the uh, patients in Mavicamptin had an improvement in symptoms while they're on the medication. The medication ramps up. It continues to get better because the half-life of the medication is long. And then it reaches a plateau at about 10 weeks. And at 10 weeks, you have improvement in symptoms. But then once the medication is out of your symptom, out of your system, all of a sudden your symptoms come back. So it is showing that there is uh, an improvement in symptoms during the course of this duration. Whether the symptoms continue to improve over time, we don't really know, but it seems to be a plateau in most of these patients. 
Dr. Desai presented the Valor trial just earlier this year, looking at Mavicantin versus placebo now in class three heart failure patients who are slated for SRT. And this opens a discussion about SRT versus Mavicantin. And this is, in this data, over 80% of patients were able to avoid SRT using Mavicantin. Now, I want to be very clear about this because uh, it's not that they all uh, could avoid it, but they could avoid it mainly because of the fact that their gradients no longer were over 50 millimeters of mercury. So they did not meet indications for SRT at this point. So 80% of patients no longer had gradients over 50 or met indications for SRT compared to only about 15, 20% uh, of patients or so, 24% of patients in the placebo group. Once again, they showed the LVOT went down uh, both at rest and uh, on provocation. And once again, they saw the EF was about the same, maybe a slight decrease in EF, but an improvement in the KCCQ uh, approaching 80 on a scale of one, uh, zero to 100. Again, we see BNP going down with Mavicampton and troponin also going down, <clears throat> although not statistically significant. So this is a nice summary slide, I think, of CMIs versus SRTs and kind of where our head is at, at this time. You know, novel medications can avoid invasive procedures and risks. And they, they can defer SRT for a later time or at all if needed. And they may target both fibrosis and obstruction and prevent progression, although we haven't seen that yet. That'll take longer term studies. On the other hand, there's some, there's some concern for significant drops in EF. And, and as, as you can see from the studies I mentioned, that may take up to 10 weeks to see the full effect because of the long half life of Mavicampton to see what happens to EF in these patients as we roll this out. And it may not be as efficacious only because the peak VO2 that we've seen so far is about 1.5, rarely over three compared to SRTs, uh, which are over four or five. And robust data and long-term data will take time. On the other hand, invasive therapies may double the VO2 increase, at least so far, it seems that way, although we don't know for sure um, over time. It, there's more significant and durable improvement in 90% of patients, large clinical data on outcomes, including survival now after 10 to 15 years. Many patients want to eliminate, not add medications. Reduction in sudden cardiac arrest risk and mortality appearing in long-term data. Procedural risks have come down significantly with volume. On the other hand, there's significant regional variability in use and outcomes. And I don't think we can go around and, getting, and get everywhere in the world to do high quality myectomy and ablation. So I really do think that medications will have to come along and, um, and overachieve so that we don't have to rely so much on these, on these therapies, at least for now. Um, and, on the, and also pacemaker and open surgical complications obviously are there with the basic procedures, and so why have them if you don't need them? So the future of HCM management, I think, is, and I'm gonna leave some, I'm gonna stop soon and leave some time for questions. You know, in the patients who are asymptomatic and gene positive, phenotype negative, or, or they have a mild phenotype, or they have a phenotype without a, a genetic substrate that is identifiable, the real question is gonna come which is can we diagnose these patients early enough and then can we eliminate, limit or halt progression to symptomatic disease? We have a lot of patients who are identified by family history or by genotype and they're kind of just waiting. Is this gonna get worse? What's the natural history of my disease? And by the time the symptoms come and there's fibrosis and significant hypertrophy, is the cat out of the, cat out of the bag, so to speak? Should we be doing something and can medications be really most ideally suited for these early stage to prevent progression um, to symptomatic status. Number two, the symptomatic patient with overt phenotype. Can we eliminate symptoms in sudden cardiac arrest? Can we limit or halt progression? Can we reduce or streamline medications? Can we eliminate obstruction? Can we avoid invasive procedures? And can we improve invasive procedures? These are the questions now that we need to work on. And finally, after SRT, ideally you'd like to eliminate medications in these patients. You'd like to make sure they don't get end-stage disease because there's still a natural history of AFib and heart failure in some of these patients from significant diastolic dysfunction. Um, can we eliminate residual obstruction either with more SRT or with medications? And can we normalize residual diastolic dysfunction? These are the main questions that are coming up. I'm gonna move past these slides. This is sort of future directions in, uh, in surgical therapies for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And there's some future directions in invasive therapies, including endocardial ablation, PIMSRA, which is a, a needle-based uh, apical approach to the septal uh, without a with a decrease in the rate of pacemaker in these patients, but it's not entirely minimally invasive. And there's a new procedure with electrocautery that has significant risk and has only been tried in animal models today, but it's something that we're looking at specifically in the structural heart space that could be done at the time of, of, of TMVR if alpha tract obstruction develops. Uh, this is a paper in progress um, 
it is in press now, it hasn't come out yet, just looking at the different invasive therapies that are available for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and looking at all the therapies over time that are available for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, including the few that are class one. So to end here, we did just launch an HCM Society. We had our first meeting in September. Uh, it was really a fun meeting in DC. The idea here is that HCM has now evolved into a, into a disease state that really needs people to wrap their you know, arms around. So we put this society together. You can see the board on the right. The board has now increased to about 20 people, including patient representatives as well. But the idea is that this is a disease that, that physicians need to be in charge of, and we need to liaise with the, all the industry in this space. We need to work with all the professional societies um, from disciplines in cardiology, and then all the organizations, patient-based organizations, such as the HCM Association and the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation and Mended Hearts, put this all together to try to talk about disease state and burden awareness. Um, Clinician-directed research, so we do need registries, we need clinical trials, and we need some organizational aspect to get the best sites involved in this. We need disease state advocacy, including sudden cardiac arrest and heart failure, including in our youth. Um, we will be doing an annual scientific session specific to HCM. We already did that. And we think that this could be also a way of getting an HCM expert pipeline. Most of the big centers and many hospitals need more people going into this field. So you fellows in the audience, this is a perfect example of where you can grow into and still use all your abilities. We here have a HCM rotation. So our fellows spend time on, the, on our rotation, which is a, both an inpatient, outpatient rotation, and they love it, mainly because they get to see patients on one week, and then the next week they're doing MRIs and TEEs and CATs on the same patient. So they're following a patient over the course of a month or two weeks, uh, two week blocks. Uh, and they get to see how we manage these patients, you know, from soup, from uh, soup to nuts. So I want to thank our whole team. We have a pretty large team for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and this is our institution. And as you mentioned before, uh, the CME, uh, partly my fault, I think, uh, or partly uh, everybody's fault. The presentation came a little late. So it will be Approve a CME within the hour, I think. Shannon's working on that, and this will be the test, but don't text it until then. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Snyder, for your uh, fantastic lecture. Um, just one comment about the CME code. Uh, I think it's not ready yet, um, so we will update um, everybody once uh, this is resolved. So um, for now, I think we're open for questions. I think Dr. Vetrovic wanted to uh, have a comment or question. Yes, um, this is really a remarkable uh, summary of... Uh, kind of the evolution of a disease and really it really uh, emphasizes when someone really puts their mind to that's going to be their their emphasis what you can do and I just want to congratulate you and thank you for for being here uh, I do have one kind of quick question uh, what is the uh, what's the screening for this disease and how do you handle it in athletes? We're all familiar with the Reggie Lewis story, I guess, who fellow played basketball in Boston. And I know there are a lot of questions about what actually happened to him, but I'll just ask that because I've done a handful of uh, athletic physicals in my life, not knowing what I was doing. And I always stood the kids up to see if they had a murmur. <laughs> yeah. I think this is an area of uh, a lot of controversy. I think, as you know, around the world, uh, Italy and other places do it more frequently. They have a national screening program with EKGs. Other places uh, don't believe in it as much. This country, I think, there's been a lot of controversy because of the fact that when you screen all these athletes, you may find a lot of things, uh, just like doing full body CAT scans, a lot of insulin and you're not sure what to do with them. In fact, the, the majority of what you find is not hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's a lot of other stuff, and it's not clear whether to take these patients out. Now, on an individual basis, um, when athletes come, they usually come because they have an EKG abnormality or a murmur, um, and they need a full evaluation whether they have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or not. So when I see them, it, it can be quite difficult. Now we have more tools. So now, with uh, obviously, we start with echo and EKG. It is very clear to me that the EKG abnormalities precede the echo abnormalities. So usually, the EKG is abnormal in 90% of patients with HCM. And the echo may be more subtle, but a combination of EKG, echo, and MRI in these patients usually will find a phenotype for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now remember, the younger they are, the less that those maximal wall thickness cutoffs are, are relevant and the more that you look for asymmetry. Um, most of the young patients don't have fibrosis, so it's not really as helpful. And then you can look for diastolic dysfunction. So subtle diastolic dysfunction in an athlete uh, is a problem. They shouldn't have diastolic dysfunction. They should have normal diastolic function. Uh, 
Um, and so I think we need to get better and better at doing that. So if they don't have any of those and the maximal wall thickness is good, no significant asymmetry, MRI, EKG, and echo are normal, these patients can be cleared. If you have some discrepant findings where uh, you have some EKG abnormalities, but the MRI and echo are normal, you have to make some decisions. Um, and in most of those patients, we do end up, quote unquote, clearing them with the caveat that they need more careful monitoring over time to see if they progress, because a lot of them are very young. In terms of national screening efforts, I think each state is doing it a little bit differently. There is uh, more and more emphasis on the AHA screening criteria for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy for sudden cardiac arrest in athletes. And if you fail that screening test, uh, which is a questionnaire from pediatricians, then you move on to more testing that to come to you or to come to others about uh, looking to see if they have other risk factors for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or any overt phenotype. I do think that our country should move towards one standard nationally. That obviously takes a lot of work, and you're an expert more in state-based state, state by, uh, based legislation than I am. But I do think that uh, that's where we need to go. We need to get more consensus. And, and uh, up until now, there's been a lot of discrepancy, mainly because the leaders in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have not really gathered together to have a, one consensus on these guidelines. I think we need that, and then we need to push it at the federal level to say, what are we going to do with our youth in, in, in one way that's standard fashion? Sounds like a good goal for your new society. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I, you know, it should have some weight. And if we can organize ACC and the other organizations together to defer to us on this or work, for, work with us on this, it might be something that we could do. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's was wonderful. Thanks, George. We have a few questions in the chat here. Uh, Dr. Haman Patel, he's one of our advanced heart failure attendings. He's asking, do you screen for sudden death with monitors after alcohol ablation? So I screen for, so the, so the sudden cardiac arrest aspect and the heart failure aspect um, are completely disparate in that um, whether you have alcohol ablation or septalmectomy, you should continue to screen for the risk factors for sudden cardiac arrest before and after those procedures. That being said, the older you are, the less likely you are to have sudden cardiac arrest. And so alcohol ablation patients being older than matching patients, they have a lower risk of sudden cardiac arrest at baseline. And number two is after such reduction therapy, the risk goes down even further. So if you're an 80-year-old person and you had subproduction therapy 10 years ago, you know, I'm sorry, you're not dying from sudden cardiac arrest from HCM. You may die from sudden cardiac arrest from, from VT, from uh, occult CAD that now becomes a problem, but it becomes less important. That being said, I continue to screen, and screening means that I do a, a one-week uh, monitor for these patients every year until they get to an age where I don't think they're gonna, I'm going to put an ICD in these patients, no matter what I find. Um, and uh, I'll be honest, as you screen later on, um, I'm more likely to pick up AFib. And so as they get older, the main risk for screening on a monitor is really to pick up a cult uh, AFib that results in stroke in these patients um, and needs, needs better therapy. The other screening modalities that we do are really clinical history, any intercurrent syncope, um, and you know, obviously maximal wall thickness at this age is not going up again. So the other, and, and the scar burden. So the last thing is the scar burden. In younger patients, I'm repeating the MRI every three years to look for scar burden improvement, uh, improvement or, uh, or worsening to see if it hits certain, certain thresholds that might uh, uh, push you off the fence and into the realm of ICD. In older patients, I'm not doing that for the same reason which is that as you get older, the risk of sudden cardiac arrest goes down. So that's one of the challenges the guidelines really haven't addressed, which is that this risk of sudden cardiac arrest is age-related. It's also procedure-related. Um, and so we have to individualize therapy for all these patients. And, and in some patients, it doesn't make a complete sense. Um, there will be another guideline update. I just got an email. So I wasn't on the 2020, but I am going to be on the 2024 guidelines. Um, that we, we, we haven't even started yet, but we saw the writing group. So I think in that new guidelines, there'll probably be discussion of sudden cardiac arrest more, such as these types of questions. And certainly there was no discussion of the cardiac myosin inhibitors on the last guideline, which is the impetus for the update now. Thank you. Um, next question is from Dr. Makia. Um, he's one of our non-invasive cardiologists and he runs our HCM clinic here. Um, excellent lecture. Is there, a, uh, is there a septal thickness cutoff to perform high quality SRT with less risk complications? Yeah, in general, 1.5 centimeters. Um, but I think honestly, uh, you know, where this gets tricky is that a lot of the patients with, 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 uh, who need alcohol ablation, they have a very focal basal septum. And so they may have 1.5, but then it rapidly drops down to one, right? So it's very focal. So the real trick here is to do alcohol ablation and really get 
perfect to that one spot that's thick and not encroach any of the alcohol into the mid septum where it all of a sudden becomes a one centimeter septum. And that's where the risk of VSD goes up. So if you're less than 1.5, you have to be much more careful. So I think expert surgeons and people who do alcohol ablation a lot, we can be very precise on the location to, to make it the, the least risk of VSD. And surgery also, I, I can tell you even in our own experience, we've been doing matchy now for five, five or six years. Um, they're much more aggressive now uh, going deeper. So can my surgeons do a 1.4 or 1.3 septum and make sure that they leave 0.6 behind? Sure. But I'm not sure. I think that's where the learning curve comes in. Um, and most of the failures in, in the beginning are by doing being too timid to avoid BSD, but you've lost your efficacy. Thank you. If you don't mind, we'll take one last question from the Castle. He's one of our EP attendings at the VA hospital. Um, great presentation. Can you comment on phenotype difference between HCM and severe hypertensive uh, or severe hypertension? How do you differentiate in your practice? Yeah, so that's a good one. Um, so severe hypertension will usually cause uh, more symmetric hypertrophy all over the ventricle. Now this is, you know, it could be a little bit asymmetric because some people have a little focal basal hypertrophy and then they have hyper hypertension related hypertrophy everywhere else. The real distinguishing will be on MRI. They have maximal wall thicknesses from hypertension are almost never over 1.5 diffusely versus in, in HCM it is over 1.5. In addition, in, H in hypertension, you're not going to see the type of scar that we see in uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is really patchy interstitial in the, in the regions of maximal wall thickness. So those are the two main ways of distinguishing uh, hypertension-related versus HCM. And then obviously, you can also do genetic testing, and if you have a positive mutation, you'll see that in about 40 to 50% of patients. That's obviously a distinguishing feature as well. Thank you so much. Um, really appreciate you spending the morning with us, giving us this great talk. That was a pleasure to be here, of course. Thank you. Uh, if I get any more questions, I will email it to you if you don't mind. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you so thank much. Thank you everybody. very much. Thank you, everybody.